Joe and I, being well versed in logistics, started looking for studios. So we had focused our search on New Jersey. We checked out a few studios, and then all of a sudden we walked into Sweet 16, and it was perfect. We didn't know exactly what we were looking for, but when we walked into Sweet 16 Studios, we knew we had found it. And the minute I walked down there, I could feel it. As ridiculous as it sounds, it had the right vibes, but it also had all the right technical aspects that we needed. Proper lighting, enough room to move around with cameras. It had a vocal booth with a glass insert in the door. A drum booth with glass doors. It was run by a great engineer named Paul Sukovich who turned out to be a tremendous asset to this documentary. We gave him our agenda. It was pretty ambitious. We wanted to do 16 songs in essentially a live environment. It's gonna be a live to tape deal. I know that's not the way you usually do things, but we have experience in doing it this way. We told him we knew exactly what we were doing. We not only had it all planned out, but we're the pros from Dover, and we've been down this block once or twice before. He's hearing what we're saying. He really can't believe it. Uh, he's probably never met anybody like us. Usually people would come into his studio, they were not particularly well organized, they didn't really have a clear vision of what they wanted to accomplish, and consequently the sessions reflected that. And he was able to immediately see what we were trying to do and he flowed right along with it. We really needed his help. Some of the tracks were difficult and needed to be built as we went, and it turns out we discovered we were working with Dr. Punch. He was able to punch us in and out wherever we needed it. He would never object. He would never say, no, we can't do that, or no, I can't do it that way. It was, hey, that's an interesting idea. Let me try this, let me try that patch. And just give me a minute, I'll have it for you. He was becoming part of the creative process. And once he saw the intensity, he rose right up to the same level of intensity. And uh, it made the process work. Playing in the basement of the house on 84 Weed Avenue, even though it wasn't a gig, just playing down there was almost like a gig. All um, was the basement was huge, the acoustics were very harsh, so it gave a real like you're playing in a big hall effect. With the two big guitars coming through these big Fender amps, every weekend was like a concert for us in the basement. Once we got into that house, it was a free for all. But 84 Weed Avenue was a critical point in the history of Crash because that is where Fred Peterson came into the whole picture. And uh, it was down on Weed Avenue, fun, fun, unbelievably. Come down, play whatever you want, as loud as you want. I brought him to Weed Avenue. I said, here, plug into this amp and play. Play anything you want. We just play as loud as you want. We got this big amp and everything. You know, I had a, a Gibson SG. It was my first uh, real professional guitar at the time. And it was a great experience, and he had a great time. Oh, it just sounded awesome. I did this guitar solo, and it just <laughs> blew me away. It still blows me away to this day. This is where we decided that it would be great to have Frank and Fred work together. Me and Frank hit it off instantly, instantly. Um, they developed guitar harmonies for all the Crash originals. The sound became huge and very interesting, and people started to listen, people started to like it and it was a very interesting experience.